Good morning, I'm Sophie Rovner. Welcome to this news briefing from the 255th National Meeting and Exposition of the American Chemical Society in New Orleans. We're joined today by Cole Serrato from the University of South Florida. He's studying a vegetable compound that could have a key role in beating Alzheimer's disease. Mr. Serrato. Thank you, uh, happy to be here. Um, so before I get into a bit of my research, I'll just kind of tell you a background on why we chose the uh, path that we did with looking at Alzheimer's and how we might be able to prevent uh, Alzheimer's and some of the associated diseases with uh, oxidative stress. Um, so Alzheimer's, as most of us know, is a uh, memory-related disease where we tend to lose memory over a set amount of time. Um, and chemically speaking, that loss of memory, loss of memory is uh, thought to be caused by a chemical called amyloid beta. And so this chemical will undergo some amount of oxidative stress within the body, uh, which I'll get into a little bit more as I look into the uh, process that we looked at. And so this oxidative stress will cause the amyloid beta molecule to misfold. And like in many other prion diseases where proteins will tend to misfold, this often causes a cascade of misfolding. And so Upon this uh, misfolding and this cascade, these beta amyloid molecules will often travel to the brain and aggregate on the neuronal tissue, and as this tends to aggregate, the, uh, uh, there tends to be some cell death in the brain, which is what leads to the uh, loss of memory. So there's a lot of research that has been going on on how to break up these plaques that are on the brain. Uh, our approach wasn't necessarily to look at the plaques themselves, but looking into the prevention of the plaques. Um, so, in kind of going backwards a couple steps in the process, I explained uh, what we had looked at was how to prevent the oxidation or peroxidation of the molecule, thus preventing further misfolding of the molecule. And so, what we understand about the oxidation of this beta amyloid molecule is that one of the main culprits for this sort of oxidation, for this sort of chemistry, are certain metals, uh, such as iron, zinc, and copper. And so we specifically looked at copper, given its propensity to form this oxidation very quickly, and we wanted to see how we might be able to prevent this sort of oxidation, this cascade of oxidation that can occur within the body. And so rather than taking more of a pharmaceutical approach, we wanted to make this sort of approach something that anybody and everybody can get into without necessarily needing, needing a prescription. And so one of the molecules that we had come across was something that is found in beets. It's predominantly found in beets, though it is in other uh, cactus plants and uh, flowers. But when you look at a beet, that purple color is actually the chemical that you're actually, we're hoping is preventing this oxidation from occurring within the body. And this is a chemical called betanin. Uh, betanin is a chemical that we know can bind to metal, and that's part of what we had looked into is a verification that yes, it does bind to the metal catalyst that is performing this sort of degradative oxidation that is occurring within the body. And then we had looked at how the betanin, in a very chemical perspective, is able to prevent this sort of oxidation. So what we had seen uh, using a model system to observe the oxidation is that upon increasing the amount of uh, Beta in the in the medium, we can actually prevent the we can reduce the efficiency of the overall oxidation and peroxidation, and we can see this. Uh, so far, I've measured it up to close to 90% reduction in the overall efficiency of the oxidation. Uh, and then for peroxidation, I believe the latest numbers that I have had was around 70%. Uh, so what we're hoping is that. In an age where people are starting to look more at what they're consuming and what they're eating, that hopefully this is another another source of data that people can use to understand that you know we're trying to get you to do the same thing your mother's been trying to get you to do since you were a kid, and that's you know eat your vegetables or eat your beets or anything like that. Um, so I think this will be a good step forward in looking at how we can preventatively treat Alzheimer's. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? And if so, please state your name and affiliation before asking your question. Uh, so it's Kath O'Driscoll from Chemistry and Industry magazine. Um, could you say this effect, I know you've looked at copper, would you expect it to be generally applicable 
across all of these metals. Also, can you just say where these metals come from? Oh, these metals, I'll start with that one because it's just one of those things you're going to come in contact with them. Um, these metals are something that you absolutely need in your, in your body, in your diet, there's no way to avoid them. And in fact, if you were to completely avoid them, you're probably gonna get even more ill more quickly than you would if kind of taking the approach that we're looking at, kind of blocking some of the unregulated types of interactions that you might have. Um, the first question was, what's the first question again? And, and the other question was about the, um, uh, <laughs> I think that, that, that would it be applicable to other metals as well, your results, your findings that it actually blocked oxidation? Uh, based on previous studies, yes, I do believe so, because there is some interaction between uh, many of the transition metals, I mean that whole block of the periodic table in the middle, other studies have shown that there is some sort of interaction, so we'd expect that yes, there should be some interaction between these unregulated iron molecules or atoms and these unregulated uh, zinc ions as well. And what concentration of betanin did you use to get that effect? I mean, would that, and how, sort of how many bee shoots would that be equivalent to if somebody ate um, bee shoots? I'm trying to think what the concentration was in the beet juice. I know in the body, uh, the overall concentration of free amyloid beta is incredibly low. I believe it's in the picograms uh, for older patients. The beta in itself, well, excuse me, when I was looking at the overall concentration of the beta in, I did it relative to the uh, concentration of the amyloid beta. And so, what I specifically looked at was up to half of an equivalent. So if I were, say, using um, one microgram of amyloid beta, just as an example, I was using half a microgram at most of the beta -nin. And this is actually not by mass, but it's by molecule. So it's a half equivalent of the beta -nin. It gets a little tricky. Like, I'd imagine that we could go even further with the prevention of the oxidation. The tricky part is the methodology that we have used is based on color. And so if you look at a beet, that's an intense, intense color. And so often what happens as you continue to increase the amount of the beta -nin in solution, I might need to start looking towards another avenue of measuring this because now the intensity of the beta -nin just washes out a lot of the uh, results that are reliable now. And so we believe that it could go higher, but it's just really hard to tell. Do you have any advice for people? I mean, you know, consuming how many beets? Um, how many beets? Um, most people, I would just say introduce it. I don't think I could give you a straight up answer on how many beets a day or how many beets a week you should be looking at um, because our perspective is more so looking at the chemical interaction between. And so what we're showing is it doesn't take much. If there's not a lot of amyloid beta in the system, it's not going to take much uh, beta in the system as well to kind of prevent this sort of oxidation. And moreover, um, what's really interesting about this molecule is that opposed to some other molecules that have issues traveling across the blood-brain barrier, uh, there was one piece of research that actually showed that in mice that this beta molecule actually travels through the blood-brain barrier and you can find it in the brain as well. Thank you. Uh, ben Master from Chemistry World magazine. Uh, I'm, I'm intrigued about the beta in itself. So it, it crosses the blood-brain barrier. Do we know how well it survives digestion? Um, it actually does pretty good with digestion. Um, kind of two stories on that one. One of them is kind of anecdotally, a lot of doctors, if you're having any sort of um, digestion uh, sort of surgeries, they often tell you not to eat beets because they can't tell whether or not the, it's beets or bleeding. Um, yeah, because it, it does survive. It, it actually survives better in lower pH conditions. So between pH of 2 and 6, it's relatively stable. The lifetime tends to decrease over time as it starts getting introduced into higher pHs such as blood, blood pH. But it does survive over a period of time that you know it could work within the brain. And how does it actually bind to the metals? Do we know enough about its structure to know what it's doing? Yes, and that's uh, one of the things that I'm excited about in my own research, because that's kind of my baby, is looking at the direct interaction between the metal itself, which is doing all the chemistry, 
and the beta man. And so it's a direct correl correlation. So if you're familiar with the, uh, with the types of molecules there are, there's two carboxylates off the side of it and a nitrogen in the middle, and those are prime uh, metal binding agents. And so this makes it very uh, specific towards binding towards metals. A very good metal binding. And is that irreversible? Would it, would it lock onto that metal and stay, or is there a, a, a dynamic that would be the metal gets released later? And there's always going to be some amount of dynamic because there's just that's how the body is often working. So um, it depends on what else is in the area that's competing with that that metal binding. Uh, and I guess to, to take it full circle, uh, do we know how the body handles it? How much is it excreted? Is it broken down into safe metabolites? Oh yes. Um, from what I can recall about the metabolism of this, it's based off of, uh, number one, one of the key ingredients is sugar, um, and our body handles that very well. Um, the other ingredients, as part of the molecule itself, is a tryptophan, and that's essentially another molecule that we often have in the body. And then the rest of it, our body can kind of sequentially break down, um, or just excrete as it's not needed. So it's relatively, it's, it is safe, you know, within certain extents, just like anything in life, you know, you get a certain amount, you're going to cross the threshold at some point. So I don't recommend eating like all your meals as a beat, but you know, if you haven't eaten a beat before, go ahead and start. <laughs> Thank you. Bill Bustle, ACS. Uh, what's the affinity of beta to copper itself, like, as opposed to, uh, to uh, 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 Target that, that essentially is involved in Alzheimer's. Uh, uh, go a little further. Further, obviously, Alzheimer's is, is mostly supposed to be old people's disease. So, so would it have any particular effect if, if you consume uh, compound, uh, foods with large amounts of bacon, like, like you know? If, uh, if you're a uh, Slav, you eat the worst, and uh, so, uh, so forth. Uh, when you were younger, because uh, ceruloplasmin is one of the, uh, one of the critical uh, uh, compounds in, in, uh, during pregnancy. It's copper protein, it's, it's, it's critical for, uh, for uh, pregnancy and, and the baby's development. Uh, would you not be afraid of, uh, of uh, beta mean kind of, kind of complexing the, 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 the copper out of there and interfere? Or, so would you suggest to, to the younger people stay away from meats as opposed to older people uh, eat lots of meats? Um, it's, that, it's speculation. But, uh, absolutely. It's a really good question because I, hadn't, I didn't actually know about the uh, interaction with the high amounts of copper during pregnancy. Uh, but I would imagine uh, like you had said, speculation, is that beets during pregnancy, like most of other things, most likely going to be safe in moderation. I don't want to give you like stamp of approval to eat beets during pregnancy, but um, the body has some pretty cool mechanisms that prevent things like weak binders, or I wouldn't say weak binders, but kind of intermittent binders such as beta -nin from interfering with things where you need the higher amount of copper. So I'd imagine that it shouldn't interfere if you just eat a beet during a meal. Um, but again, just like I think one of the previous questions, it's when you start introducing more and more and more and more, it's where you might start seeing issues, but we see that with many things uh, in the body as well. Hi, so it's Kath O'Driscoll from Chemistry and Industry again. Um, just to ask, what's the sort of next step to look um, with this research? Are you going to look at the neurodegenerative diseases? Would you, are you expecting that it might have an effect on protein folding and some of these other diseases like Parkinson's or uh, things like that? And also, do you expect it would have an effect on tau protein? Because that's the other one that's associated with Alzheimer's. Um. I'll start with the tau protein question because I kind of anticipated this one because a lot of people often in the industry argue back and forth about you know, the differences between tau protein and amyloid protein. Does one cause another? Which is the chicken? Which is the egg? And so at the end of the day, kind of my thought on this is that 
if the tau protein is acting alone, why are we still seeing the amyloid beta plaques? And so with these plaques, whether the tau protein is causing the amyloid or if the tau protein isn't involved at all, regardless, we've introduced something that could prevent the oxidation that's associated with the amyloid side of it. Um, as for the tau protein side of it, uh, for my sort of experimentation, that's a little bit more difficult on my side, just because I don't have the, the necessary setup to look at the proteins themselves. Like with the amyloid beta, I have the uh, advantage of working with a small peptide. It's not nearly as, as fickle as working with some proteins. And so I'd imagine that in the body, regardless of whether you know, tau is causing amyloid beta or if it's just amyloid beta alone, this is going to help some amount of the antioxidation. And moreover, even if, uh, in the chance that someone one day proves that you know tau protein is the way to go, amyloid beta has nothing to do with anything, what we've introduced is a molecule that might also prevent other oxidative uh, stresses within the body, and that's what causes a lot of the diseases associated with the aging as well. And so this is just one avenue that we can look at. And so we could look at other avenues, such as Parkinson's, I think, uh, uh, Wilson's or Wilkinson's, I can't remember off the top of my head, is another one that's associated with metal oxidation uh, in the body as well. And also, the release mentions um, the possibility of looking to improve on betaine, um, with a, you know, by making drugs, I guess that's one real term, but how mm -hmm. might you speculate that you would actually improve it to make a drug? Um, I hesitate on this one just because it needs to be very specific towards the um, A, beta, and the metal itself. Um, metals that are in the body, around 50% of all the proteins in our body have some amount of metal in them, if not as a catalyst itself. And so we want to be very careful about how we approach this because just attaching or attacking any metal in the body like we do with heavy metal poisoning, um, we often have some amount of detriment as well. So we need to be able to balance the detrimental side to the, the positive side of this. And so what I like about the approach that we're currently taking is it is a food source, it is a food stuff, uh, not necessarily a pharmaceutical. There could be ways that we could make this into a more specific drug if we're able to target the, uh, the binding site as it has uh, three histidines that bind to the metals within the A-beta molecule. Uh, but as for how to modify the molecule itself to enhance the binding for that specifically, I don't have an answer to that for you yet, and I hope that you know someone could look into this a little bit further than what I'm looking at right now. Thank you. Any further questions? One at the back here. Probably the last question, but um, this is Katie Cottingham from the American Chemical Society. And I'm just wondering, have you done studies in animals yet, or are you still doing things in vitro? Um, we're still doing things in vitro. We wanted to show in this study the chemical interaction between them, because obviously if we do move on to uh, animal studies, they're going to want to see this chemical study in vitro study first. And so this is kind of the first step in looking at how the beta den might interact at a chemical level rather than in the animal. Thank you very much. The archived version of this session will soon be posted at bit.ly slash Live underscore NOLA. Please join us for our next press conference at 9.30 a.m. today on a candy cane pop that could power future functional networks and devices. Thank you.